Thanks, Judge. Okay, we're back in San Francisco at the, the big EMC VSpec event, and this is a special services angle uh, interview with Barbara Spitek, who's with Brocade, Vice President of Channels for Brocade, uh, no stranger to the channel business. This is a, event is all about the channels, about the services, it's about the services angle, and you can go to servicesangle.com as our reference point for all the innovations in the services business. Service providers, web services, application services, customer service, and channel services, channel support, very disruptive. Barbara, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, to theCUBE. So we just had uh, Arrow on, uh, you and I were refer talking to those guys and you know, they're distributed, they've seen, they've seen it all, they're huge, they've been a monster and they have huge size, they have a lot of customers. Um, and we didn't get a chance to talk about some of the things that you and I were talking about prior to, to uh, going on, so I want to kind of have a special spotlight on, on, yep. on the economics of the channel. Um, <laughs> channels changed, um, and in uplift markets, IPO markets growing, opening up, Companies are growing, opportunities are there. So you had uh, some ideas you wanted to share about the profitability and the economics on the channel. What's your, yeah. what's your thoughts on this? Well, I, you know, I wanted to um, go a little bit deeper into, we talked uh, a little bit about the, the whole channel transformation, right? What the, what the clouds and the, the uh, you know, IT deconstruction actually mean to the channel, how they're all changing models. And, I think there's a couple of things that, that are uh, happening. I mean, one is the um, clearly the buying behavior we talked about, CapEx versus OpEx. So <clears throat> when, we, when we talk services, I also talk about financial offerings. And I think most, most vendors are nowadays trying to also add financial offering as a part of you know, um, what I call channel partner business model awareness. What do you mean by financial offering, you mean? Well, there's anything from the, uh, there used to be the classical lease options, yeah, but for example, options, Brocade, yeah. Brocade uh, um, instituted last year what is called Brocade Network Subscription Offer, which is actually, um, which is actually part Basically of a subscription financing. basis. Yeah, but it's subscription is actually, it's completely um, not owned anymore. It's complete transformation from CapEx to OpEx. On a lease, you still, you still own the asset. On a subscription service, you don't own the asset anymore. So that really takes the entire financial burden off the customer as well as the channel partner. So it's really, really, um, you know, uh, disruptive, you know, models. And the benefit to go that way is what? For the customer? To go. It's for, the, for the customer yeah. is obviously, to, uh, as I said, immediate transfer to uh, OPEX versus CAPEX cost. And that is, you know, part of the, the, the change in model they're looking for. The, the buying behavior is one. The other one we've seen is, and this is really all about services, right? It's the it's the need for expertise and skill set. As these infrastructures are growing so complex, as it's all changing, as it's being re-architected, um, we, we, we heard in several interviews before, the customer as well as the channel partner is under huge pressure to, to have the right level of skill sets. There is a shortage of uh, savvy SEs, right? The yeah, certifications yeah. you need to hold when you do end-to-end. -end. They can't hire fast enough. I no, mean, they in can't. The, in the areas that are most critical, data, cloud, architects. Exactly, and when you look at this, this is again where as vendors, and I think Brocade and EMC teaming up, what do you have to be? You have to be very much investment aware because it's, it's costing the channel partner a lot of money you know, to set up these army of, of SEs. Explain what you mean by investment aware because that's, let's drill yeah, down on that. And that's so placed right into the, into the profitable model because as they are changing the model, as they need more skill set investments, they're looking at vendors to either have very compelling certification programs, which are actually self-funded, which is what I think both uh, ourselves and EMC invest a lot on, so it saves them cost. Uh, they're looking at as much web-based, you know, and more online and e-based training modules rather than SE timeout, it's critical. And then they're looking at these things like what we offer with EMC, uh, uh, support service packages, you know, that they can just take to the customer, architectures they can take there, pre-tested, pre-validated, so it doesn't require their skill set. That's what I meant by push button. I yeah. mean, essentially turnkey. It is, it is turnkey. And then on, on top of that, things like the the joint lab we're actually talking about, where they don't have to do and do proof of concept and demo investment. This is what I call investment, where all of these, you know, mm -hmm. are, are driven to improve the bottom line at the, at the reseller base. What, what do you, with all these new dynamics changing, obviously that changes some of the tactical things involved in the channel business. Yeah. Like the old days, what Jeremy Burton said, oh, we just throw money at it, and the old model co-op, and then see you later. Yeah. You know, I mean, the channel's always been kind of a fickle beast yeah. in the sense that you got to kind of give them some love, but not too much love, let them do their thing, no conflict, throw yeah. some dollars to support them, 
and then listen. And, that's, and, and that's, if you don't listen, you're dead. Yes, and that's why you, that's such a good point because that's why you got to be, I think channel programs, and like you say, is really fickle. It's always like you have your usual set of tools, right? You have yeah. the deal registrations, the backend rebates, the co-ops, yeah. as I said, training, funding. You have your usual, you know, set the of The table tools. stakes, you know. But the, 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 I think the big question is really, you know, how much of those you use and how you use them. And I think one of the key things that as, a, as a, a smart vendor and a vendor that wants to invest in channel partners that provide value is really you know, the, to tie those things into skill sets and specializations. And I always call out in our program, and so does EMC, it's a pay for performance, right? Rather than pay to participate. And I think that's very important um, as you try to drive profitability, you have to make sure if they invest, if they, if they get better, right, they should be paid on. And uh, one of the things I wanted to highlight as well within um, VSpecs, that is a, such a fantastic example of a meet in the channel. We really did like a 360 package around it. Not only do we have the compelled technology offer. 360 package mean 360 view all of all around, the stakeholders. All around, all around for the channel, I'm specifically channel saying. Channel stakeholders. Channel stakeholders, because not only do we have a compelling offer that empowers them, right, to be that point of integration for the customer, mm -hmm. Both EMC and Brocade teed up and tied a whole bunch of components around it. We, we teamed up in deal registration, we joined up in obviously the lab. We're gonna do actually some direct, um, even, even rewards at the sales basis of the resellers. So we really tied a package together that mm -hmm. we said, not only do we have the most compelling offer, but we also have a whole bunch of benefits. And that I think is, is as, we, as we call our earlier, a smart, smart use of your channel components. Well, well, we'll wait and see on how that result is. I mean, obviously from a packaging standpoint, as Dave Vellante pointed out, you know, this is really nice packaging. And you yeah. know, we noticed that with the VNX launch in January was packaging's fine, you know, as long as it works, yeah. right? And customers will vote with their wallets and we'll see what happens and obviously the market dynamics. Um, but I gotta say, I'm impressed with the approach. I think it's totally channel friendly. Um, again, you know, we talked before we came on, the channel, you know, needs certain things, but there's a new model going on. So with that in mind, what new things are you seeing in the channel marketing business? So channel marketing today and then going forward, what do you see as new things that will emerge? Maybe it's something out of the, the, the V-Specs launch or something else. What's your vision around yeah. channel marketing? So like you're saying, the channel is really, you have your set of tools, right? The new things are really always, always uh, difficult. I think one of the new things, for me, and I, I keep on mentioning it, is really that you have to be aware that these guys are changing business model. And that goes to distribution where there's still vendors that think that's just pick, pack, and ship, right? And they do logistics and financing. But I think as we heard of some of the other interviews before, these, the, these guys are all changing their model. They're adding a lot of value. They're putting integration centers in place and so on. At the same time, the resellers um, are all looking for where do I play my role in the cloud, right? Do I just resell, do I do services? I think as a vendor, one of the big things I see is you have to be aware of those changes and you have to make your, your, your program more modular, more flexible. So that's, that's, for me, that's one of the key drivers because we will, the, the, channel, the channel model and, and the, the way that they go to market today will not be the way that they, they go tomorrow. Yeah, and I think Pete Kaliopoulos from Arrow really underscores that point where he said, just kind of off the cuff, and yeah. I'm really glad we had kind of stumbled in that area, is that relative to your point about changing business models, yep. um, is Arrow essentially said, hey, we've always had data that we've collected through our distribution business, but now they're taking the big data approach to build new products to change yep. their business model. And it's not just a me too, it's actually they're using big data yep. and using existing legacy data. So to me, that is uh, an example of what I see as good channel market. At the end of the day, he just underscores it and summarizes, says, hey, it's about sales. Yep. You know, I can go and get better sales leads than my salespeople. Well, and this That's is, fantastic. I mean, the classical, the classical thing, like what does a channel partner look for, which is PPP, you know, product profit and push, which means leads, yeah. it's still the same thing all over, right? But the, the, the push, and I think that's also what Pete mentioned, Every, every vendor talks about lead generation, right? But ultimately, that's always the, one of the most difficult yeah. things. Do you give you know, unqualified leads? And that the way that uh, Pete described it, using solid end user data, I think, is also something that you can really bring to the, to the, to the channel partners. You know, this is a complex business that we're in. It's getting easier thanks to these kinds of VSpec solutions. And, you know, it's always going to be challenging to abstract away the complexities and make things mm -hmm. simple and efficient, which I like that messaging from EMC. But it's still going to be challenging. It's still complicated. So you have uh, a global view. You handle global channels. So, you know, multi-tenancy in the cloud in the U.S. might mean something completely different in the, you know, European community. So what's the global flair 
for you? Or yeah. the, what's the perspective <clears throat> there? I mean, is it? And that's, that's actually a great point. That's also a great point as it comes to services, because I mean, we're in the United States here. So we're talking about um, services where most vendors have like a complete broad layer of support infrastructure in country. Um, some of the regions I'm dealing with, you know, um, wouldn't even define an SME as an SME. That's like the large top enterprise customers <laughs> yeah. in these countries. And the channel partners do everything from soup to nuts, right? Yeah. You don't even have to tell them to do, uh, to try to bring new revenues and services because a lot of these guys act as uh, support partners, professional service partners and single stops, you know, in country distribution reseller. So I would say the, the interesting thing is from, from a global perspective, it's usually the, the more you go out of the, from the core markets, the model gets very, um, I would say, self-sufficient, and channel partners do almost everything, you know, from distributor through, through reseller, through support and service provider. Yeah, and, and having a global footprint means a lot now differently than it did a while ago. I mean, now, with the web and the internet being global, and with mobile being global, it means something differently. It actually means something now. And business can be global faster now than it used to be. In the yeah. old days, it used to be hard to be global pretty fast. Um, my final question to you is uh, kind of more of a philosophical question around kind of the state of the channel. If I would say the statement that cloud, mobile, and social is the disruptive three major trends driving this change with data being the disruptive enabler underneath yeah. all those, if that's a true statement, what happens to the channel evolution from this perspective of where are we today? So, meaning, this, because this VSpec launch really underscores to me, like, okay, a, sh a mind shift, mindset shift yep. in thinking around cataloging and how products are going to be packaged with the notion of providing big scale support, almost like a massively scaled system. Where's the channel? Are they in kindergarten? Are they in elementary school? Are they in college? I mean, what's the, where are the channel, where's the channel business? Is it too early? On a scale of one to ten, ten being highly yeah. mature, one being born. I think I think on very uh, I, I think on various stages. And again, first of all, from a global perspective, this obviously depends on the marketplace because the United States, Germany, UK, France will be in very different position than Eastern Europe as a part of Asia, right? This is yeah. I mean that level of maturity Let's is talk purely US. geographical. Let's yeah. say US and the big So yeah, if we talk West when um, when I talked earlier I think about the whole channel transformation where I see where I, where I you know, I, I as I said I call it identity search. You know, yeah. they're all trying to position where am I going. Um, the reality is, though, I think uh, the analyst and also myself, you know, and, and things like VSpecs are designed for enabling channel partners to build out private clouds primarily, of course, hybrid and public, but the analysts still say the next couple of years will be a lot of hybrids, uh, of um, private cloud build out. Yeah, first, private cloud build out is a lot of classic data center build out. So I think yeah, most with a channel cloud partners, twist. It's, like a, it's, it's, it's not cloud washing, it's just cloud 1.0. Yeah. Uh, but the but the thing but the thing is that means I think there still is a lot of you know hardware build out infrastructure build out opportunity yeah. which respects you know enables them to do even better. Um, in terms of maturity, I I tell my channel partners though ad adapt or vanish. Right, you got to think now about what happens in the next uh, four or five years because some of them are even further thinking yeah. about different business models. Like I said, some are doing their own application hosting or backup services or you know managed services. Some are really thinking on concentrating on cloud resale. But I would say maturity probably 10, 15% are adopting. I think the rest are still thinking about it. Yeah, and if you think about it too, right, what you just said is kind of interesting because I look at SAP, for example, I just came back from their press conference, been covering them and EMC. I mean, this is cutting edge stuff. I mean, what we're doing is really making infrastructure decoupled from essentially application-like environments with some middleware glue in between. And that's hard stuff, right? And to roll that out onto a channel, an indirect yeah. channel offering, is really, really compelling. So I think it's early, but it's really going to be a differentiator. I was just, you know, even SAP, they're having a huge uptake, but that's just, they're cutting edge. So the channel is quickly with there with the product. Yeah. So I'm excited by it. We'll see if the channel can suck it up and absorb it. Yep. If they can get trained on it and get all the tools integrated into into this kind of formula because it's essentially rolling out infrastructure I'm at larger well. scale. There's and I keep on telling them it's a, it's if you don't see it as a threat, it's a huge opportunity. Yeah. But they got to adapt. And as we said earlier, there's margin in the mystery. There's margin in the cloud. I think the cloud's the real deal. And uh, Barbara, thank you very much. Uh, that's a services angle special, channel economics breakdown in the VSpec launch. 
very complex product uh, packaged simply and elegantly for the channel. If that's truly going to pan out, it should be a home run for EMC. Barbara, thanks for your commentary and analysis. We'll be right back with our next interview right after this. Thank you. Code ciphers and code breakers have been around since the beginning of time. Julius Caesar used ciphers to communicate with his armies. Secret coded messages were brought as evidence of treachery in the trial against Mary, Queen of Scots. She lost her case and her head. The German military believed their World War II Enigma machine generated an unbreakable code, which was soon cracked and exploited by the Allies. But today's digital society poses even greater opportunities for code breakers, criminals, hackers, and nation states who wish to shatter encrypted websites and systems to access, steal, and sometimes destroy what's inside. More than 21,000 people attended the most recent RSA security conference in San Francisco entitled, The Great Cipher is Mightier Than the Sword, to learn from the best cryptographers and internet security experts what they can do to keep themselves and their businesses safe from attack. San Francisco. Our industry has succeeded in making the internet, with all its weaknesses and idiosyncrasies, safe enough to transform the world. With increased speed, agility, and cunning, attackers are taking advantage of gaps in security resulting from the openness in today's hyper-connected infrastructures. We can ensure that the balance of control of our digital world re remains in the hands of security practitioners. We can give them the tools they need to identify threats quickly and eradicate them. We can give our industry the structures it needs to share intelligence so that we can all be in this fight together and that knowledge gained by any one of us can become power for all of us. Throughout the whole floor, there's just an energy, there's games being played, there's fun, exciting things to see. So I'm gonna take a step off of the RSA floor today and look around and see what else and what other fun things I can get into. Cheers. Actually, I, was a, I did the talk on firewalls. I think it was RSA 1 or RSA 2, and awesome. it was down in the basement with Fairmont back when it was just this little bitty conference. wonder about these designations though because would you really want to go talk to someone who's a troll? Courtney just did. I know. You seem like a pretty nice guy <laughs> too. Yeah. Trolls this get a bad name. All right, all right. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I apologize to all the trolls out there. That's right. I'm sure you're all lovely people. 